Hello everyone, thank you very much for watching this talk. I'm Bharat Ashkesan and I will be talking about the statistical test for probabilistic fairness. This is a joint work with Jose Blanche, my supervisor Daniel Kuhn, as well as Vieta Negan. Human beings attempted to categorize people and to discriminate against the ones that are, doesn't belong to the same group as themselves. For example, in the past there was discrimination against people for some, of some races uh, that took place even in the restaurants. People took actions against women's suffrage. More recently, it came into light that uh, BBC has a gender pay gap, meaning that the male staff earn 9% more than their female colleagues, although they are doing very similar jobs. There is opposition against same-sex marriage. Also, it's known that uh, students who self-identify themselves as uh, lesbian, gay or bisexual are often bullied at school and even cyberbullied in internet platforms. Uh, all of these ex uh, examples show that humans have a tendency to display unfair behavior. On the other hand, um, algorithms are conceived and function following strict rules of logic and uh, algebra. It is hence natural to as expect that these uh, machine learned models uh, deliver objective uh, predictions and recommendations. To mitigate the subjective perspective in the decision-making processes involving uh, human beings, the algorithms are uh, providing appealing assistance in these processes. Unfortunately, in-depth investigations reveal that the unfortunate reality that the state-of-the-art algorithms uh, uh, assistance in, is far being from free of biases. Initially, this is because they up to detect in underlying patterns in the data that we unintentionally then they unintentionally learned and maintain these biases, uh, existing biases in the data sets. Now, actually, algorithms are having uh, taking uh, in the decision making uh, decision making processes that have very consequential um, results in our daily lives. For example, no algorithm determines whether you can buy a home or not, or um, advertisements that you see, and it turns out that, for example, these advertisements are fat. Uh, for the high ex uh, high profile executive jobs are mainly proposed to the male users rather than the female users and whether you can get a medical treatment or not or you will get a job or a promotion or not is actually determined by the algorithms right now furthermore the defendants that uh, like uh, the assigned as a high risk to reoffend is also determined by the algorithms which has actually these decisions impact radically many people's lives together with the future of their loved ones so I would like to go to a very simple setting to see what can actually go wrong and uh, to argue with uh, like how we can understand if a classifier is fair or not. So for example, we're going to consider this logistic regression classifier. It's a binary classification setting. And let's assume that the data generating distribution is indicated by this P. And uh, the, uh, the model actually parameterized by beta and it says that the probability of, of the outcome is going to be 1 given the feature vector is actually determined by the sigmoid function and the whole aim is to find this beta by solving this uh, loss minimization problem. Okay, and the loss function is indicated here and once this beta is chosen, the algorithm's output is 1 by compare, uh, one or 0 by compare, determined by comparing the sigmoid function with the given threshold or predetermined pre threshold value tau. So in this picture, what we do not know is actually the data generating distribution P. And instead of solving this loss minimization function, expected loss minimization function over P, we use the empirical observations and we solve this problem by, by minimizing this uh, loss by using the training data set. So let's go to a very simple setting that has two, uh, two dimensional feature vectors. And then we're going to assume that this, um, these are the defendants, the features of the defendants, and y is equal to 1, indicated by red, are the defendants that reoffend after their release from the prison, and the, the defendants indicated by green are the defendants that do not reoffend after their two years of release from the prison. And then suppose that we would like to train a logistic regression classifier that is trying to that we're trying to learn the beta and in the end after the training procedure let's suppose that this blue uh, like sorry the purple line is the decision boundary and as you might guess like this right inside algorithm says predicts as the defendants to reoffend and the left inside algorithm predicts the, the defendants to not to reoffend 
What can go wrong is although we do not these features, but suppose that these features actually the vertical axis represents the prior offenses and the horizontal axis is the skin pigmentation. As you might guess that this uh, actually like the skin pigmentation information is highly correlated with the sensitive attribute known as race. And these are actually in some cases prohibited by law to be used in the training procedure and when we train our um, algorithm even without not using these sensitive attributes this actual skin pigmentation is highly correlated with this race information that still we can say that this algorithm is not making fair decisions if the protected class is denoted by these pluses as in the figure then actually this algorithm is saying that all the defendants belonging to this protected class are going to be uh, a predict to re-offend. Okay, so we can see that there is something going on wrong in the picture by just looking at this algorithm. And what we would say is that this is not fair. And the aim could be intuitively tilting this boundary towards the horizontal axis. But in a higher dimensional setting, it's much more complicated to say, to say what would be fair and how we can measure fairness if you have many more features that are correlated with the sensitive attribute. So scientific community put a lot of effort to find what does it to define uh, algorithmic fairness. And here I would like to share some fairness definitions. For example, disparate impact is imp inspired by US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And it says that the rates of positive predictions of protected and unprotected classes should be the same. While equalized odds proposed later on impose the true positive rates and false negative rates to be equal between two subgroups. Equal opportunity frames criteria provide a relaxation to no this notion by only requiring true positive rates to be equal between two subgroups. And later on demographic parity and so on and so forth. So here in this paper, we focus on the equal opportunity while whatever we're going to say can be also applied to equalized odds. And let's take a closer look into equal opportunity criteria. As you say, as we see here, this is trying to make these true positive rates to be equal between these two subgroups. And we can also write this previous definition as an expectation, as, a, as it is a probability, we can write it as an expectation of an indicator function. We see here that these actually, um, these functions are discontinuous. And when they are actually imposed in the training process and even in the testing process, in somehow they provide a computational burden. In some cases, it's very hard to solve these problems. And that's why a relaxation is pro proposed in 2017, named after probabilistic equal opportunity, by not looking at these uh, thresholded function, by, by just looking at these expectations of these hypothesis of the probabilistic classifiers. To see that this is actually not a bad um, approximation, we can we actually provide here a simple simple comparison uh, by looking at the unfairness uh, landscapes. So suppose that we actually are in two dimensional setting that we have different classifiers by varying these beta values, and then uh, here these actually these pictures actually like is discretized um, discretized points are different classifiers, and we look at the unfairness values. Namely, we just take the difference of the previous definitions. And we just look at the absolute values. So when we calculate it, as you see, like the um, when the unfairness comes to zero value, it becomes the fair classifier respect to this motion, notion of fairness. And we see here that this uh, like darker pink values represent these fair classifiers, and then we can see that they are matching between two the, these notions. This says that like these two notion of fairness are actually having consensus on what does it mean to look at to be a fair classifier. So it's really not a bad relaxation. It also smooths the um, smooths this landscape as we see in the picture. So um, the previously mentioned biases and their impacts have uh, sparked substantial interest in the pursuit of um, algorithmic fairness. So it's very important to have uh, fair algorithms, but as well as, I mean, it's also important to be able to test whether a given algorithm is actually fair or not. And it's actually a first order importance because if you can say it is fair or not, then you can actually construct a better uh, training procedure based on that. And now, uh, based on this motivation, our paper is actually about testing fairness. And with that, I would like to uh, present you the statistical test that we're going to consider throughout the paper. So the null hypothesis is indicated by H0, and it says that the classifier H beta is fair, while the alternative hypothesis says that the classifier H beta is not uh, fair. As we have seen before, all these definitions are with respect to this underlying probability distribution, and that's why we, what we're going to do right now is that we're going to look at the manifold of distributions, 
such that the classifier, given classifier, is fair relative to these distributions. So here we just denote it by h of uh, f of h beta. So now the previously mentioned uh, null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis becomes the following, takes the following definitions. So if P is actually inside this, I mean, is an element of uh, this uh, manifold, then we can say that the classifier H beta is fair or alternatively, we're gonna, we're not gonna be able to reject the null hypothesis. So to be able to see if it is actually inside this manifold or not, we need to find that uh, endow this distribution space with the distance. We choose Wasserstein distance, and it's a very popular distance that is recently used. Also provides the geometric flex flexibility of the feature space to the to the auditor. So it is defined as a distance between two probability distributions, and it solves an optimization problem to compute this distance. And it minimizes this expected uh, cost, indicated this by C, of moving mass from one distribution to another and uh, by with respect to these couplings uh, between uh, Q and Q prime, with the marginals Q and Q prime. And it's actually a long standard field that is initiated by Gosford Munch in 18th century and is known as optimal transport back then and still also known like that. And the uh, Wasserstein distance is just a special case of optimal transport problems. And actually we choose this cost in a special way. Also one can choose a different one, but we assert an uh, absolute uh, trust on the true label information as well as the, um, as the sensitive information indicating that they have infinity cost to move these, uh, these informations. So Wasserstein distance inherently tries to minimize this cost so it wouldn't move these uh, label informations from one distribution to another. Okay, so as we are well equipped with this Wasserstein distance definition and we endow our space with that, now our null hypothesis uh, as well as the alternative hypothesis can be written in a different way. So we, if we're going to check if P is actually in this manifold or not, we can alternatively look at its projection and look at the distance of this projection, like minimum Wasserstein distance of this uh, distribution P to this the distributions in the manifold and see if it is actually zero or not. If it is actually zero, we can say that we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. All right. And then actually like... Um, Actually, what we can also say is that, like, if the Wasserstein distance is actually greater than zero, we can see, see that this P doesn't belong to these fair distributions, and in the end, H beta is not fair. So basically, um, again, in this picture, what we really do not know is this true uh, data generating distribution P, and instead of so looking at this problem, we are actually looking at the uh, finite number of samples from this distribution indicated by P hat n, and we are naming naming it after test data. So we only have the test data and the uniform distribution over this test data, and we can only calculate that in the real life. So now, actually, um, let's see if we can actually calculate this distance and how it is hard to calculate this distance. It's actually, uh, it turns out that if you're going to indicate the square distance by R of, then actually it turns out that it is, it is equivalent to solving a one-dimensional optimization problem. While the initial optimization problem is non-convex, it is again one-dimensional and it's actually in a bounded space. So now we also can take a look into the limiting characteristics of this test statistics. So when we, uh, if we denote our test statistics by n multiplied by this R of and then we can actually see that uh, of representing opportunity here, um, we can actually see that as number of samples increase, then it's actually uh, it actually the limiting distribution is actually a scaled chi-square distribution. And here theta is the scale parameter that is dependent on the true data gener uh, true data generating distribution information. Okay, and uh, in the end, as it is scaled chi-square, it's actually a gamma distribution that we can obtain in the if we know the true data generating distribution. So here is the construction of the hypothesis test. So what we do is like for a given uh, test data, we calculate this distance to this manifold. Then we compare it with the given for a given significance level alpha, we compare it with this eta value, like the quantile. Uh, if this this actually this actually here indicates the CDF of the of the our limiting distribution. And then we compare this value with this uh, quantile for a given significance value, and then we reject if it actually exceeds this threshold reject the null hypothesis. So, but in real life, I mean, in practice, right, we do not know this true data generating distribution again. So instead of like looking at the really true data generating, uh, sorry, uh, limiting characteristics, we actually ap uh, approximate them by sample averaging. Okay. 
And here is this uh, limiting distributions that we see. And what we are trying to show here is that as the number of samples are increasing, they we fit to the limiting distributions much better. And actually, yeah, we can actually see it in the in the in the actually better in the cumulative distribution functions of these uh, of these limiting distributions. We also provide this asymptotic validation of our test. We say that as the number of samples increase, like for a given significance level, the rejection probability, the rejection percentages, uh, given that this experiment is actually uh, like mm, repeated several times, it's actually well captured when the number of samples are increased. As we see here, that if we're going to sample some test data from our uh, toy example that we know the true data genetic distribution, calculate the test statistics with that test data, calculate the uh, limiting distribution uh, statistics, and then if we're going to apply our test like that and keep the track of the number of rejections, then we see here that we can match with the, with the given significance level value. Alpha, actually here. And also, our test provides an uh, interpretability uh, as well by looking uh, by actually like uh, being able to compare compute this most favorable distribution. So it is actually the projection of the test uh, te empirical test distribution to this manifold, and it is denoted by Q star. Here in the picture, we, we see the visualization of the most favorable distribution for a logistic curse file with given weight beta. The black arrow here indicates the vector beta, and the colors represent the class. The symbol symbolic shades indicate the sensed values. Also, what we see here is that the green lines show the transport plan of the empirical test samples from the original positions indicated with transparent colors to their ultimate destinations with non-transparent colors. What we see here is that as we are looking at the equal opportunity criteria, the samples that are moving has the true label information y is equal to one. And uh, in the end, this gives us some intuition about how this test is actually performed. And further, it gives us some, in, uh, some interpretation about like um, what is the minimum effort to, from, to get your uh, fair distribution from your current empirical test distribution. With that, uh, we also perform a numerical experiment on a compost data set that is well known, I think, by the fairness community. And we see if how we how our algorithm actually like how, how our tests perform for a um, normal uh, logistic regression classifier. So compost is a commercial tool used by judges and parole officers. And it determined the criminals, uh, criminals defendants' likelihood of recidivism. It computes the risk of a uh, score of reoffended for uh, defendants. And it actually has 10 attributes, including age category, race, and gender. So here we see that like two uh, defendants. And then in the right hand side, it, uh, like Bricia Borden is actually assigned as high risk by indicating eight. However, when we look at the prior offenses, she has much lower offenses than uh, Vernon Prater, um, much uh, less severe offenses than Vernon Prater, although she is assigned as higher, uh, with higher risk. So here we says, uh, indicate this as race as a sensitive attribute, and we randomly split this compass data set into two data sets, training in the test, and we applied training, uh, we trained this um, of regularized logistic regression, we obtain the model parameter beta, and then we audit our model with the Wasserstein test that we just discussed. And in the end, we see here that as the regularization parameter increases, the test accuracy decreases, while we see also that like, the, it decreases in such a point that like the accuracy decreases such that the, we obtain the trivial curse fire. After that, our test actually lets this um, uh, let's uh, fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that this Compass data set already has inherited biases that naive approach, like using a Tikkun of regularized logistic regression without any awareness of the fairness, is actually not going to perform well, and we are always going to um, we are always going to reject this null hypothesis. So, with that, I would like to come to the concluding remarks. Our test actually has some favorable aspects, and I would like to come uh, talk about them. First of all, it provides this geometric flexibility by letting the tester or auditor to choose this cost function. And also, it can be generalized to probabilistic equals OS criteria. And it also provides some interpretability results by, by providing the computation of the most favorable distribution, the projection. And here are the references that I mentioned during the, uh, this presentation. And thank you so much for your attention.